interviewing Victoria Mitchell Vasquez as part of the Oklahoma Native Artist Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. We're at the Cherokee Nation Health Center in Venita, and I'm catching Victoria on a rare day when she's not busy as a tribal counselor for District 11 for Cherokee Nation. Victoria, you're the daughter of celebrated potter Anna Mitchell, the only one of her daughters to become an award-winning potter in your own right. You've taken your mother's legacy in new directions, garnering awards at Santa Fe Indian Market, Idle George, Red Earth, Cherokee Homecoming, among others, and teaching the art of pottery to many other people. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born at uh, Claremore, Oklahoma, and grew up in Bonita. Remind us what your dad did for a living. Um, early on, Dad was a, a rancher for a little while, worked on a ranch in Welch for his uncle, and so he was a cowboy. And he always wanted to be a farmer, but he never did get to be a farmer. Later on, he went to work at the Venita Post Office, and he retired from there as a rural route postal carrier. Do you have any memories of your mother's early pottery experiments? Well, actually, Mom didn't start until I was already gone. Okay. I went to NEO, and I, then I got married young and moved away. And she started probably a couple years after I left home. So I wasn't exposed early on. Did you know your grandparents on either side of the family growing up? Yes. Um, I have more memories of my dad's parents, um, Clay and Maddie Mitchell, and they also were longtime Benitans. And they lived in town, and a lot of times when I went, uh, would be going to school, I went to part of my school at uh, Riverside, a little grade school in Benita, um, we could go home and have lunch with them uh, in between and then go back to school. And they lived like two blocks from the school. So I knew them better, but they both still worked when I was a kid. And uh, my mom's parents were divorced, and I did not see her mother, uh, who was, uh, her Indian name was Eluta Owens, but her married final name was Iva Jumper, and uh, she died probably when I was a teenager. She never lived in the area, and she always lived near St. Louis, and couldn't afford to travel. And so we really didn't have—I didn't have a relationship with my mom's parents. Um, we would see her dad on occasion. He married again and raised a family at Jay, and so summers we'd always go down and visit him and his second family. And that was my next question, your exposure to kind of Cherokee culture and language growing up. Okay, we, um, when mom and dad got married and decided they were going to raise a family in Benita, my mom specifically told my dad, and she told us this over the years as we were older, that she did not want us to grow up the way she did, and of course she spent most of her life in boarding school, and her language was stripped away from her, so she, she didn't have good memories of childhood. So she wanted the best for her kids, and her idea of best was to um, raise us in, in town, in the need of going to public schools, going to Presbyterian Church, and not being raised in a traditional manner because she really wasn't raised in a traditional manner. So she didn't encourage uh, speaking the language because, of course, my dad did not. My dad was part Cherokee, but he didn't speak the language. So really, as children, up until I was in high school, there was not much discussion about our culture. We knew we were Cherokee, and we you know, went to visit places like Cherokee, North Carolina, and we had artist friends, but we didn't um, practice any traditional uh, things in our home. What are your earliest memories of seeing Native art? Um, it's a great memory. In fact, this is on my website. A picture of my dad making these little Indian drums, little little drums that were made out of a, it seems like they used to have coffee cans that were about half the size, and they covered them in, Daddy would cover them in bark, and then he and Mom uh, got leather and covered the tops, and then they would paint just Indian designs, what they called Indian designs. And because we didn't have a lot of um, research material in our home, books and, you know, we didn't have TV or any of that, I believe that mom and dad ordered magazines and books about Native art, and so they used very simplified, you know, like arrows and, I hate to say this, teepees. Teepees are not in our culture, but just things that the tourist trade would recognize as Indian because they made them for 
a little trading post that used to be out on Highway 66 east of Benita, and it was before the um, turnpike went in. So there was a lot of tourist travel when I was a child. So I was about five or six when they were doing that. And they'd make little uh, moccasins, and Mom would beat on those, and they, they, these things were made for sale in this trading post. So they weren't typically Cherokee, they were just, you know, quote unquote Indian. Right. What about your earliest memories of making art? First grade, I went to a little um, country school, and I was just blessed to get to go to a country school, a one-room schoolhouse for first through third grade, and then it closed. And my older sister went there, and the classroom was probably 13 total kids, one teacher, and so she, whenever I was in first grade, there was only three of us, and when she moved on to teach the higher grades, she would let us go in the back of the room and play with modeling clay. And I had no idea that I was going to grow up and play with clay as an adult. But my first memory of making anything, me and my girlfriend would sit back at this little table with modeling clay, and I loved the idea of creating homes, little houses. And so I would make little um, four-sided structures. I had a floor and the walls, and then I'd make furniture place in there, sort of like a little clay dollhouse. <laughs> Never made a pot or anything. Just little dollhouses and little people. But you love the three-dimensional. Yeah, artwork. I did. Okay. Yeah, I didn't do much, you know, painting or drawing, but. And that's my next question. What kind of art instruction you had, you know, uh -huh. um, in elementary school or middle school? Okay. Um, growing up in, in grade school, we didn't really have anything extra for art. But in high school, I got to go one year to art classes at, in high school. And I can remember enjoying painting. We didn't do ceramics, but we did painting and drawing. And, and I can remember a painting. I can see it in my mind's eye because I didn't get to keep it. My teacher asked me if she could have it because she thought it was really good. And it had a deer and a landscape. And over the years, I so wished I had kept that because I never did really do painting after that. <laughs> so it was my only foray into drawing <laughs> anything. I did not have any formal art instruction. Um, what happened uh, after high school? Well, I went to um, NEO for a little while at Miami, and I married young. My husband was um, going to, he went to OU, and he was not doing well. He was plunking out, and those were the days of the draft for Vietnam. So he joined the National Guard, and we made the uh, crazy decision to get married. And uh, I got pregnant on our honeymoon, and so I was, as I recall, in the 1960s, late 60s, I was the only pregnant girl on NEO campus. But I was married, and back then that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. you know, we didn't see, didn't see what we see today. So I didn't finish college. I became. Um, what had been your major? At that time, it was going to be business. I really did not have an affinity for college. If I had known that I was really going to love art, I would have gone to art school. But I didn't have any of those opportunities. I had this new baby, and I turned 19 when she was when she was born. And we moved to Bartlesville, and he got a job with uh, Phillips Petroleum. And I went to work when she was six weeks old. Mm -hmm. My first real job was Southwest Mill Telephone, which ended up being a career. So I didn't get to do art or be a housewife or any of that. I just went from, <laughs> you know, a little bit of college, being married, having a baby, and then all of a sudden I have a career, a child, and a husband. And, and right. <laughs> it was fun, though. Glad I was young. So, when did you first get interested in pottery? Um, mostly I was interested as, a, as an observer because my mom was doing pottery then by the early 70s. She gave me for a, a wedding gift for my second husband and I, she gave me a, my first piece of pottery that she, it was beautiful and it, it's, I still have it and it was a real simple piece and I was thrilled. So I, I started collecting on a small scale just things that I found attractive. I didn't go to art shows back then. I didn't even think of that. I traveled a lot with Southwestern Bell then. And I ended up being in marketing, and so I traveled more. And I didn't do things that I do nowadays, like go to festivals and art shows and museums. I maybe had gone to Willow Rock and maybe had gone to Gilcrease, but didn't have that big draw, mainly because my husband was not interested he was a golfer, I had a little girl, so I didn't have a lot of free time mm -hmm. to explore. 
but I was interested in the pottery. And I would watch, you know, on occasion I'd go and watch what mom was doing. And I was the only grown daughter that would go to her shows. I had another sister, older sister, that lived here in Benita, and she had three little girls and didn't want to travel or go to any of those. So I frequently would go see mom and dad. Like she, they used to do rendezvous at Gilcrease Museum. Mom would set up there, and so I'd, I'd go to her shows. Uh, Tahlequah, when they did um, the Heritage Center for the holiday, um, sometimes she would have a booth there, and so I'd always go. And then my when my daughter got to be about seven or eight, she got interested, and so sometimes she would sit and play with the clay with, at mom's booths, and mom would give her some clay, and so that was my first. And so I was probably in my late twenties when my first exposure to thinking, "Hey, this is pretty neat." Yeah, it was kind of a great foundation in a way yeah. for moving into making your own pottery. Right. Um, so, when did you actually give that a try? I um, didn't get the opportunity until, I believe it was 1990, and I was living in Houston. I was single again, and my daughter was off in college, and I was very um, dissatisfied with my life, and I was in, in selling insurance, and was just not really happy living in the city and in a townhome, and I just kept getting this pull to, to learn it. So I called Mom and Dad, and, and in fact it was 1990 and ask if I could come and apprentice with mom and just live with them for a while. And I felt like that's the best way to experience digging the clay, processing the clay, having the things that the ready that you wouldn't have in a city. Mm -hmm. And so I went and lived with them for a year here in Benita on their 10 acres that they had. And daddy was grinding clay for mom. He would dig clay for her and help her. He traveled with her a lot. So I got to experience everything from learning to dig, how to process, how to hand build, how to decorate, and then I got to go, just as a driver, I went with them to Santa Fe Indian Market, and that's when I got the bug, and I thought, oh my gosh, I have got to do this. If I can ever, ever be good enough at pottery to go to Santa Fe, that was my dream. And um, so I did this for a couple of years, and I really wasn't working, and I wasn't making money. I was cleaning houses and doing pottery, and I realized, well, I can't make a living as a potter, and it was, but I really enjoyed it. Were you starting to sell then at that no, point? No, I wasn't okay. even selling. I was just making it and learning it. And I remember I started designing some t-shirts and I would sell t-shirts just for money. But um, the, the biggest benefit was of that was getting to spend a year or so with my parents as an adult. I had never done that. And no distractions and all their kids were gone. And the joy of getting to sit in mom's shop with her and while we're working, she would just talk and she would tell stories about her childhood, about boarding school, about art, just anything. We, I just listened and I wish I had recorded. I, mean, I had no idea that I should have recorded. Um, and then in the evenings when we were through working, dad and I would sit out on the patio and hit the back of their house faced wooded area. They had 10 acres and he loved birds and he had a cat. He always had the cat in his lap. And my favorite image of my father to this day, and he's been gone since 1997, is that visual of him sitting in that lounge chair with a cat on his lap and us out there with the birds and the beautiful leaves and the sun and the wind and just listening to him talk. And he talked about very different things than what mom talked about. So I heard both sides of the, the art story, <laughs> you know, from the person that got to do it and the person that got to help with all the driving and, and all the helping, you know, that daddy did. But they loved it, and I got a real um, feel for a legacy that I realized later that they were giving me because they studied. The, the other big thing was they had an extensive Native American library, and they had been collecting and buying books all their lives, I mean, all their married life, and that's all we knew as children. We didn't have TV, so we read, and we all grew up with an appreciation for books. And mom and dad were just avid readers and they loved everything about anything having to do with native. So they had all these different tribal books and art books and history books and, and uh, I inherited those from after mom passed, I inherited most of those books. But that's where I started really researching and learning what mom had done and looking at research. There was a couple of books that she was already in, you know, that she had been, um, her, I can't remember the very first one, but I met a a gentleman from Davis, California, Jack Berry, who's still living, and he wrote a book about potters, and he, came, he heard about mom, and he 
came to Oklahoma from California to interview her, take a picture of her pottery, and there's a little story of her. I was so proud to see her in a book, you know. So that was so. Uh, all those things led to me getting to where I am today. It was a neat experience. When did you um, sell your first pot? It would have been about 1997 was when after I had spent those couple of years with mom and dad, I ended up going back to Houston and working some more because I thought I can't make a living, you know, doing this. And it was while I was in Houston that I, the second time that I decided I am going to go back to Oklahoma. So in 1997, dad, and the, the catalyst for that was my father's passing in May of 97. I came home for the funeral and because I didn't have a, I had just gotten laid off of a job so I had some money, I had some free time, and I told Mom, I'd like to stay a couple of weeks and help you. And um, so it was during those two weeks that she was grieving and the family, everyone laughed, and it was just me and her. Um, I said, you know, how would you feel about me just moving back here full time and staying with you and really focusing on the pottery and, and helping you? And she said, well, I think it'd be great. So later that year, I came back and I started seriously making pottery, and I, I think I sold my first piece to a friend. Mm. It was a little tiny pot, and I sold it for maybe $25, you know. But the amazing thing was that that year that I, that first year after I moved back here, I met my current husband, Bruce Vasquez, and I was working part-time in an insurance company here in Benita, and my whole intent, and everything worked just the way I had prayed for it to work, that I could stay with mom, help her work on pottery and not have to work full time, but just make enough money to live. And that's what I was doing. I was working part time at this insurance company and I met Bruce. And um, I just really think that God placed him in my life because it just worked out perfectly. That the very next year we married and I got accepted in the same. On my 50th birthday was the most awesome year, my 50th year. I uh, We got married and about a month later, I get an acceptance letter for Santa Fe Indian Market. So I had six weeks to produce. I mean, you know, when you first apply, you don't get, you know, selected right away. And so I didn't know if I was going to get in. And then when they told me I was in, I had six weeks. So I just became a little factory. And you hadn't really done and any I shows. I hadn't done any shows. That was my first show. What was that Santa experience <laughs> like? <laughs> it was awesome. And I remember I had about 20 pieces, and I was going for quality, quantity. First, I started out trying to do the nicest things you know, that I could, and this was one of the pieces that, that I didn't want to sell because it was so hard to make. It was one of my hardest first early pieces that Mom said, you know, you would pick the hardest thing to try to make, and so I'm glad I kept that. But I had things about like this, native clay, little pieces, nothing great big, and um, I sold everything. That, that year and it was my first time to go to Indian Market and I just loved it. And then I got to go probably three or four more years with mom and then she stopped doing shows. And then my life got busy on the ranch and I started teaching and I found, and my husband wasn't crazy about me, he didn't want to go to the shows, he's a rancher and he's not interested in Indian art shows. And he couldn't travel because we have a full time, we still have a working ranch. And so I was going by myself and looking for people to go with, and it just became a hardship to go do art shows. But I still, you know, from that from that foundation, I started winning awards. I won my first ribbon at Santa Fe Indian Market in miniature category, and that you know was it on. that same year or no, was it, it was uh, 2000, uh -huh. 2000. And so then I started becoming serious about like Cherokee Homecoming Art Show, Red Earth Festival. Um, just things around here that wouldn't be so far mm -hmm. for me to go. and But I found in my art show experience that I, even though I'm a good, I was in marketing for years, I was in sales, I love to talk to people, I really don't enjoy the art show aspect of standing behind a booth, talking to people, trying to sell my work. I would rather educate people about our culture in the Southeast, the mound builders, and teach people how to make pottery than I would to go to shows and compete. I don't like the competition aspect of art. I've got enough awards that I was grateful, but I don't enjoy that. Um, I don't enjoy competing with my fellow friends and my fellow artists. And some people love it, and I'm just one of those people that I don't, don't care about it. But my joy came from, for instance, can we talk about this? 
piece now or these pieces now? Um, we'll do that later. Well, you can feel free to talk about it now, and then we'll sort of take. Back we'll look it. at it. We'll come back okay. to it as okay. well. Um, but what my my greatest joy came when I was approached by the Cherokee Phoenix re reporter, the Cherokee newspaper reporter, asking me if he and I happened to be in Tahlequah entering this piece in an art show, and he said. While I'm here and I've got my camera, could I do a story on you? And I was just thrilled. Well, I was holding this piece in my lap, the tripod head jar, and it was something that was very difficult. I learned how to do it myself, figured it out myself, made it by myself, fired it, blackened it, all that. And so this picture and the paper, the story came out in the 2001 fall issue. And as a result of that, I was contacted by, or I applied to the, to the Smithsonian for a fellowship. And long story, we get into this later, but it led to me selling a tripod, making a tripod head jar for the Smithsonian a few years later. So you never know where these things are going to take you, but each one of those little, what I call blessings in your life when someone asks you, you know, can I do a story? You don't know who's going to read it, you don't know who's going to be affected. And that's when I first started becoming, getting a little notoriety, not just as a person that makes pottery or Anna Mitchell's daughter but a person that has something to share and a legacy that she's carrying forward. And that was my proudest moment to think, hey, I can do this. I can represent uh, what mom started. So that's my, my greatest joy from, from those experiences. Well, um, talk about your Smithsonian experience a little bit, that fellowship. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember who encouraged me. I think it was Martha Berry, who had just done a, a the beat artist who had just done a fellowship, and also Margaret Roach Wheeler, who's a friend of mine that's a Chickasaw clothing designer. They had both just done that, and they said, you really should apply for this fellowship, and it was called, at the time, it was called Native American Artist um, Visiting Arts Program, and it's through the NMAI, and um, the Smithsonian, I mean, the Smithsonian is NMAI, and you, so I applied, and I believe they have a jury process to where at the time, and this was in 2005, 2004 is actually when I did the paperwork, and it's very extensive paperwork and um, quite a presentation of why you want to do it, what you want to study, uh, what you're going to do with it after you, if you get the fellowship. So um, I think they selected at that time maybe two artists per year, and they had a spring program and they had a fall program. and. Um, I, they called me in 2005 and said, we've selected you for this, this fall, which starts in August, and I was just elated. So it, what, it, what it was, was you received a $5,000 stipend um, to come to Washington, D.C. They pay for your, all your travel. They pay for, um, for you to have a staff person to travel with you, and, and you get to visit museums from Washington, D.C. to Boston to Philadelphia and ending in New York City for three weeks. I was in, in that area for three weeks and you start at the NMAI, uh, Suitland, Maryland location which houses all the artifacts that you're going to study. And my research was going to be specifically about southeastern mound builder pottery and artifacts and the era from say 1200 to 1700. And whatever museum had those kinds of things, that's what I got to look at. So I spent a week at the uh, cultural facility, I can't remember now what they call it, but it's a, a holding site. It's a built, big building out there where they have all of these artifacts and you get, this is just the most amazing thing. They have floor to ceiling um, cabinets and the ceilings are very tall and they're computerized and no one can unlock them unless they have the computerized key to open it. And the, I had a staff person that knew exactly where I wanted to look and he took me first to the Arkansas Mound site pottery and you've got rows and rows and rows that go way up high and you get to get on this little automatic ladder rolling thing and it's got a table on it and you can pull things, you can pull these drawers out, you can take the pottery out and set it on this table, you can photograph it, write about it, or touch it, it's just amazing. So these are things that you know were found in the burial mounds. Mm -hmm. So I did, did that for a week and um, as a payback for your fellowship, at each museum that you visit, you've got to give a program, present a program about your art and what you do, and um, just give it, and it's called a brown bag lunch, and it's for all the employees of that facility come and listen to you. And so I was giving a talk with some slides and talking about mom and digging the pot clay and all that, 
and I had a portfolio with me that I made specifically to take and on the front of the portfolio was a picture of three pieces that I had just finished and I had not sold and as a result of that brown bag experience one of the people that was helping me said hey, do we own any of your pottery for our collections and I said no you don't and he said well we need to so long story short he got the uh, curator to purchase those three pieces and that was I mean the highlight. I remember calling my mom and calling my best friend and just screaming. I have got an order. I have sold Maybe I can to the Smithsonian. Living. And um, and that was just the first week. And so then I went to we went to Harvard Peabody Museum in Harvard. Got a day there in Philadelphia, another museum, and then New York City in a week. And at each of these places, you meet different staff people and and. It's just awesome, you know, go on train, things I've never done before, go by train from Boston to New York City and you stay at a hotel, but you've got, um, you know, everything's paid for. So it's very comfortable, very easy, very fun. Um, the other rewarding part about was that um, the young man that got the award at the same time as me was an artist from Ecuador and he was from the Shuar tribe and he did not speak English, he only spoke Spanish and his native language and he tried, his, his art form was musical instruments, and also he came from a tribe that um, used to shrink heads. And he wanted to see shrunken heads, and they had them in the museums. So we traveled together for those three weeks, and after the first few days, I realized that he was not going out and doing anything. You're on your own every night. Um, because he didn't speak English, he wouldn't go out to his restaurants, and he was eating out of the candy machine at the hotel because they didn't have a restaurant. So I went and bought a little book about you know Spanish English, and wrote a note and left it with the the, t the guy at the hotel and said give this to this gentleman. And I contact connected with him and started going to meals with him, and we would communicate by writing notes or, and he'd look at the book and look up English, and I'd look up look up Spanish and we write. And by the end of the three weeks, he was only 22, and he was adorable, and he had this long black hair, and he had a headband with these parrot feathers, and, and he wore a tattoo, uh, it was mineral tattoo, it wasn't a real tattoo. And everywhere we went, he, you know, he has on a black t-shirt, jeans, and hiking boots, and then this garb. And we're walking down the streets in New York City, and people are just, you know, they probably weren't really looking at us, but some people did, you know, it was a strange sight. And uh, he was like my son at the end of those three weeks. And it was just the most, and I've never seen him again, but we had the most fun. And so I got a lot of, um, not only did I sell the work at the Smithsonian, but I met a lot of people. Once you go through this program, you are allowed from then on, you can study at any museum that will let you. You, you have the right and the ability as an artist to go in and look at their archives. And so I could go to Gilcrease, I could go any place really that if they would, you know, if they allow it, they'll, you have a, an open uh, invitation to study archives. So that whole experience led to so many different things. The only other thing I had to do in payback was to come back and give a program in my community about that experience. And I did do that at our Vinnie Green Cultural Center here in Veneta, and it was, it was great. I had a, a big crowd, I was just amazed, you know, and here was people that I grew up with in the church that used to call me Little Vicky, and now they're coming to watch me as Victoria the Potter and talk about going to Harvard and studying. You know, it's just amazing. I mean, it's just amazing the life change that came about from that. How, how did it impact your pottery? It, um, it made me want to study even more, and it made me want to look at, not only did I want to, rec to create what Mother always called traditional, Southeast pottery, but I really was drawn to the effigies that I saw, and I saw some amazing effigy pieces, and there would be anything from a head jar to a little animal figure or a fish, or I was just drawn to that, and I've not ever had sculpting classes or anything, but I would just try to figure it out myself, like how would I make this little head of a bear, or how would I make this little bird, and I had a lot of joy in just figuring out how to create creatures. And so I had a period there after I did the research where I did um, really got into the fish bowls that looked like fish and birds and we're bird playing and I love bird things so I started doing a lot of birds and turtles and um, it gave me a greater appreciation for what the potters back in the 1700s, 1600s did and they started with 
you know, cooking and utilitarian things, but yet there were people there that loved, obviously loved the art aspect because you would see some of the most amusing effigies. And my most memorable one that was just hysterical, I picked up, it looked like just a jar, and I picked, this was in the Philadelphia Museum, um, can't remember the name of the museum, but picked it up, and on the bottom of the pot was this little flat man as if he'd gotten rolled over, or like the pot had been stamped on him, you know? And it's just this figure <laughs> laying on the bottom of the pot, and I'm just laughing. And I thought, you know, people forever have had a sense of humor, there have been artists forever. There have been people that, you know, no idea is original. You'll see things on pottery that was made, you know, who knows when, like in the year 1300, 1400, that I could recreate today and make it look similar. And just, it was just a real, it was almost a religious experience to make my first head jar. When I, when I studied, and one of the places I studied was the Anthropology Museum there at the NMAI. It's right next to the, the place where all the artifacts are, and very few people are allowed in there because there are still some um, uh, funerary pottery that maybe have uh, bones and things in them. Um, so I saw lots of things in there that made me, I saw some head jars that were buried, you know, with people, and um, I didn't know, you don't really know the significance of the head jar, but they assumed that it was just to honor the person that it was buried with. And it, that's probably my biggest uh, influence in making head jars. That's my favorite thing to make, um, was from those, looking at those. But when I made my first head jar, I was going to Santa Fe Indian Market. This was probably 2003. And truly, it was my first one to try to figure out how to do a face. And I looked at pictures from magazines and art, uh, museum books and things. And I wanted it to look primitive, but I didn't want it to be ugly. I wanted it to be attractive. And I, and I did a pretty good job, I, I'm, and I was going to enter it, actually, as a, as a competition piece, because it was wood-fired and everything. And an unfortunate accident, uh, someone else dropped my box that that was in, and it broke. So I didn't get to enter it, I didn't get to sell it. I was just sick, because it was my, it was, when I was making it, literally, as I was making the face, it sounds weird, but as the face took, Form, it was almost like there was a spirit in that face. And, I'm, and I have never been that kind of person who talked about the sorts of things related to my art. But it really was a, a neat experience. But out of negative things, I've always found there's some good. And so I ended up later, much later, I go and open the box. So there's this broken head jar and the I'm going to put it back together. So I glued it back together. And I probably should have taken it to a restoration specialist and had them, and I probably still could, but here's this broken man glued back together and the head jar is still in my studio at the ranch and it's too fragile to carry around, but um, I want to copy it and make it again because it was a very, it was tough to make and uh, it doesn't look like any head jar I had ever seen. So I've, I've you know, reaped a lot of positive influences in my, my art to take a different direction. You know, it's interesting because I remember your mom saying she didn't like the head jars. Right. Because your dad didn't like them, I think, mainly. Right. That's why she didn't explore right. them. And I don't know why dad didn't. I don't know if he thought they were ugly. In the pictures you saw, they were ugly. They were, they're not real attractive. And I think that he wanted mom to make beautiful pottery. And she did make beautiful pottery. And he, daddy was more concerned with the uh, commercial aspect of it, like how much she was going to get for it, and each year he wanted her to win more ribbons and to make more. And I, not necessarily that he was money hungry, he wanted to elevate her and to see how much higher she could go and how much more exposure she'd get. And mom really would like to have played a little bit more and experimented, and dad would discourage her. And so she just always said, well, Daddy didn't like head jars, and so I just never made them. And, and I said, well, I like to make them, so I'm going to keep making them. <laughs> and she liked them. You know, she was impressed when she saw um, my finished product. Um, I know that you've had friendships with other potters, and I'm not sure if I'm remembering correctly if you also took some workshops from... Uh -huh. with Jane Austen, or can you talk a little bit about work with other potters that you might have done? Yes, actually I worked, my most memorable and most extensive was actually with a potter that's not Cherokee, and his name's Richard Zane Smith, and he's a Wyandotte potter, 
and I met him at Taos when uh, Blue Rain Gallery was still in Taos, New Mexico, and it was during Indian Market time. Probably about 2006 or 2007, I met him, and I was impressed with pictures of his work I'd seen, and he does this amazing corrugated pottery with these tiny coils, and he's famous now, where he's really he's well known, and his work is just amazing. But I met him and went up and told him I was a potter from Oklahoma and that how much I liked his work. Well, that led to later, when he could get away from his adoring public, he said, I am Wyandotte and I would love to come and visit Wyandotte, Oklahoma. And could I stop by your ranch and, and see how you do your, you know, just stop by? And I said, sure. Well, it ended up he did come to Oklahoma and he stayed with us for a week and he brought his daughter and they went to the pow powwow at Wyandotte. And it led to this longtime friendship and this relationship that we decided we would do a workshop together. And he invited me to, the first thing he invited me to do was help him with a Philbrook um, workshop he was giving on this corrugated hand building. So he spent a whole day trying to teach me how to do that, and I just didn't like it at all. It's very hard, <laughs> and it's nothing like what I do. And, um, but I helped him teach that class, and that was fun. And then the next year, he said, why don't we put on a workshop in in the Wyandotte area, and then he, he and his wife decided they were going to move back, move to Wyandotte. They lived in Santa Fe, or they lived at uh, Glorietta. So they moved to, bought some acreage uh, near Wyandotte, and he and I put on a week-long or two-week-long um, workshop open to any Native American. They didn't have to be Cherokee or Wyandotte, but it, they had to be Native American. And we did it for free. We didn't charge them, and, for, and so he would work during the day, and I'd cook at home and then I would come in, in the afternoon and so we did this every day for two weeks and we had elders that came and we had young people that came moms and you know so we ended up with about probably eight potters or eight people that really really liked it and made and completed works and then he showed me how and I helped him dig a pit on and this was at the Bearskin Fitness Center which is now it's still there Bearskin Fitness replaced where it's on the grounds of where Seneca Indian School was mm -hmm. And so it's a very sacred place, and my mom went to boarding school there for a time. So on the final day, we uh, we had taken everybody's pottery home and dried it, and you know made sure it was completely dry. And we had a firing, and we built this pit, and it took about four hours for us to make this thing. Uh, a bulldozer had come and dug out, you know, maybe not a bulldozer, but a little digger, probably like a four foot deep rectangular hole, and we lined it with fire bricks and, and cement blocks and he'd done this before and I had never done anything like this so it was really fun and I learned a lot and we fired the pottery and then he just left it in there overnight and then the next day and that night we had a potluck everybody brought food and we sat around the fire and told stories and things and then the next day we and everybody's pot came nobody's came, they came out well nobody broke anything it was amazing and that was the most just the most uh, fun just a real good learning experience for me to be exposed to a different art form by a different artist from a different tribe. And um, we became friends and did some other things together. And then because we both got so busy, and then I got really busy with my art and teaching that I've just not been able. We talk on Facebook now, and so we need to get together. I see him at Santa Fe when he's doing the Blue Rain Gallery demo. You know, I'll go in there, and we live 45 miles apart, and we never see each other anymore. But I learned a lot from him, and one of the things that I learned from him that um, I asked him if I could use his idea, and he, he said it was fine. He had the, used to make these big, he probably still does, but big bowls, and they're made with all these tiny coils. So he'd have this big bowl, and he would have black sand, and then he'd have four or five smaller of his pieces in there. Well, I'm drawn to gourd effigies and plant life. And so I said, would it be all right with you if I make a big bowl, not like yours, but just a big bowl, and make squash effigies? And he said, I don't care, you know. So I started doing that, and I have sold about five of those. And they're very, they're very fun to make. And instead of sand, I would put beans. I'll either put white beans or red beans. And I sold one at the Department of Interior Indian Craft Shop last year. And um, they're just, you know, it's just that one little idea, and I had never seen anybody do that. And um, so, you know, artists love to share, artists love, you can learn from anyone. Every, I think every artist does that, they can learn from other artists, and it doesn't matter what your level of skill is. And that was kind of your entree, it sounds like, into teaching, too. Right. 
Yeah, I, I really enjoy that. And actually, my first class was in about 2001. Erin uh, LeMaster worked at the Cherokee Heritage Center and asked me if I would teach a class, and I didn't really feel qualified to teach a class, but I did. And there was, but it was made up of tourists that came through for the day, and they'd signed up ahead of time. And so I had maybe nine or ten non-Indian tourist people, and I, you know, we made a pot, and oh, it was just really difficult because I'd never taught, so I didn't know what I needed, and I didn't know how to do it with that many people. But we, it was successful, and then we left the pots. I think they fired them there later. But um, I learned a lot from that, and every time I would do a class after that, I would figure out what was the easiest way to teach, what kind of tools do I need, and it led me to, I've done this for a while, almost 15 years now, uh, probably 12, 13 years I have taught. It led me to going back to simple is better. So instead of taking all my tools and all these things, I take two or three pieces of what we're going to, you know, like if I'm going to teach them how to do bowls, I take bowls. If we're going to teach effigies, I take my little effigy collection. Um, and I have a pottery board that I've made for the classes, and I use the same natural tools that Mom and I use, you know, the river stones and the uh, gourd neck that you smooth the inside, and uh, handmade paddles that you smooth the outside of the pot. And people love that. You know, one of the things that I stress in my classes is that you don't have to have money to make pottery. You can go dig your own clay. God gives everything in nature that you can use. The river stones, you can make your own paddle. You can use sticks and, and shells to decorate. Um, you just need water and your hands. Mm -hmm. And so I've simplified it to where people are really seeing the impact of what our ancestors did. You know, they worked with whatever they had. And that's what we do. And I try to avoid working with commercially made tools and, you know, commercial things. I like handmade. Love wood. I love working with wood. My husband makes my paddles for me, and and uh, I even found some little pods, seed pods that have a perfect cross indention. Made a clay stamp out of that, and people love that, you know. But it's from nature, and it's uh, it's just there. So that's that's the fun part. But yeah, the classes. Um, I did learn a lot from that experience, and I'm still learning. Um, you did some work with Cherokee National Living Treasures Committee. Um, can you describe that a little bit for us? Yes. I, in fact, it's an ongoing <laughs> process. I was uh, nominated and, and received the award in 2012 as Cherokee National Treasure, and there are currently about 45 living, and there have been about 83 or so designated when the program started in the 80s. And, um, I got to, I didn't get involved until after mom had, uh, I think I went with her to one banquet before she got sick and um, then short, when I became a treasurer then I'm of course allowed to work with the, the group and there is an association, the Cherokee National, I mean the Cherokee Nation has a, a department, uh, the education department that oversees the national treasures and, and their budget covers putting on an annual dinner. Uh, at around Christmas and we receive gifts and uh, it's really nice, really nice thing. What I'm working on now is, um, with some other tra treasures, is trying to get more exposure for the elder national treasures that don't get out, maybe they don't drive, and maybe they can't even make their art form anymore, but they can teach and talk about it. And so as a counselor, I have taken that a step further and one of my goals in my four-year term is to create a a uh, program within the nation that's partially funded by grants and funded from from the nation to pay uh, the mentors and the, the people that they teach and we want to teach young Cherokees that are committed to learning the art because they'll be the next master artist and I would like to have a free co-op for the masters and the Cherokee National Treasures in which to sell their art and have it in one place in the nation somewhere in Tahlequah where all these different art forms are shown and have regularly scheduled um, workshops where they can come and talk or they can teach or they can show how they make kanachi or how they make the food or how they carve a bow. And it's getting a good reception. We, we are at the point where we, re we have applied for a grant through National Parks and uh, waiting to see if it's awarded. And from that first grant, 
we will take me and not me, but other national treasures will go and interview the ones that, that the elders and the ones that haven't been out in the forefront. Interview them and say, what kind of things would you like to see this program do? And we're going to model it uh, after the call of arts and crafts at, at the Eastern Band that North Carolina has had for, I think they've had their program over 30 years and it's highly successful. And it's time that Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma has something like that. So um, it's been great. To, to receive the award was wonderful, but what you can do with it as a result of receiving the award, um, you, you know, it does elevate you and your work and your stature as an artist and as a Cherokee. And then being on the council is another bonus because I can reach more people as a counselor than I could as one artist. So. That, that sounds wonderful. Um, is that, you think, maybe one of the most important art um, initiatives that you've worked on so far? Yes, okay. definitely is. And I've done small things, but um, I've worked some with the uh, local Vanita, Vinnie Green Cultural Center. And Vinnie Ream was not native, but Vinnie Ream was an artist back in the 1800s and sculpted Abraham Lincoln. And that statue is in the uh, Capitol building in, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And she became more well known because Elias Boudinot lived in the area and had a thing for her. And so <laughs> it was a kind of a little romance that never did happen. <laughs> and people talk about that in our little museum here in Vanita, uh, Eastern Trails Museum. Uh, I'm getting ready to serve on that board. They have just installed a really nice um, display of mom's uh, pottery, and I've given them some for tools and some for clay, and they have things about Benny Green. Well, the Benny, and I digress, but the Benny Green Cultural Center is a building that was purchased by some a philanthropist here in Benita and donated to the city for, or to the community, and it's funded just through donations. And it's an old house that was a lovely two-story home that people lived in a long, long time ago, and it was just sitting empty. They fixed it up, and now they now have um, weddings and teas and all kinds of things. And we did, Mom and I did a pottery class in that building when it was first available. Well, now it's too nice to have the nest, messy arts, and so there's a little building behind it that was probably the service quarters for this house, and we made it into Annie's workshop, named after another local artist um, that passed on and I've taught pottery classes there. So I have been involved here in my home, original hometown and stay involved in that. Um, I get lots of calls for just all kinds of things, but I teach pottery classes and um, help with cultural events and try to get more and more uh, notice for the Cherokee artists. So. And how about the Cherokee Women in Art Association? Are you, you were one of the founders, I guess, of that, or co-founders, are you still involved with them? Too? Well, actually, it, it came about and went away so quickly, <laughs> and what happened, it was sort of an experiment, and it wasn't really my idea, but it was Sharon Erla, and um, Sharon Erla is a, a painter, and then um, um, Verna Bates, who's a board artist, were talking at Cherokee Art Market about us doing, I think it was Sharon's idea originally, and she said, wouldn't it be great if we could get some women, Cherokee women, to do exhibits at various places to get uh, interest in the Cherokee artists, women specifically. And so we found five of us, and uh, one was Debbie Edwards, a sculptor, and me, and Verna, and Sharon, and then uh, Catherine Radcliffe, who's a basket weaver. And we, it all led up to having, we, our first exhibit was at Bull Rock, and it was last summer. I believe it opened in May, and it was stayed up until mid-July, and we would take turns on the weekends going and hanging out in the gallery and visiting with the, the tourists. And as a result of that, we all did sell some work from that, which was nice. We got some national exposure. But it was too difficult to keep it going because every artist is busy with their own things, and especially women. You know, have, we all have families and husbands that like to eat and travels. And, and it was just too, it just kind of fell apart. And so, um, we decided that it was not something that we could continue with. It, it was too much work for a little that we gained from it. So it was fun though. Let's talk about your techniques and process maybe a little bit more. And I'm wondering if you can describe how your early formats and approaches might have changed, your early formats in clay and approaches might have changed um, as, you know, compared to what you're doing today. Okay. 
I learned from mom, she would tell me, this is how you're supposed to do it because that's what she learned or she taught herself. And over, after, uh, after I learned and after I became successful at making pots on my own, I worked by myself out in my own shop. And I took the ideas that she gave me and the, the knowledge that she gave me and I still, you know, digging the clay, that process never changes. Processing the clay, getting it workable, that's all, that'll never change. And the difference that I see in when I first began, I was aiming for the same kind of pottery that mom made and things that she was well known for. And then, because I'm an artist and because I was her daughter and because I wanted to do different things, I started branching out and trying to do just trying to do different things, um, using those those techniques. And I was amazed at how, you know, I do remember this, the one lesson I learned from mom that always applies and still applies, Jane and I tell our students, Jane Austen and I, whenever you're making whatever it is, you first look at it as a vessel or a pot. And you make the pot and then you change it in some manner to look the way you want it to look. So when I discovered how much I could manipulate the clay and make things different just from this little simple bowl, I wanted to do things different. So the first five years probably, I just stayed with what I knew. And I'd experiment a little bit on maybe shape, but then I asked mom, she was well known for her, her melon forms, and she would actually put a, take a real leaf and press it and make a clay leaf and put a vine and do these beautiful pumpkins and melons. And I asked her if I could do that, if she cared if I made that, because it was something that she kind of made up. And she showed me how. And so then I took the melon form, that's my other favorite thing besides the head jar, my melon forms are what I love to make because I love gourds and melons and uh, weaker gardens all of our lives. And so I can still see, and I buy a gourd just for decorative purposes, and then I try to make it into clay, make something that looks like a gourd. And so I learned the processes, the technique, they can, you can apply them in any, any way. But what I, what I kept that I like, you know, I could have ventured out into glazes and things that other artists do, which I think are beautiful and lovely, but I would prefer to stick with the earthenware clay and the simplest way of making things. And, and I, the one thing that I did not carry forward that I wish I could is mom's firing methods of the outdoor firing pit that dad built her. And the metal tub and putting the pots in there and four or five hours and the wood. It, for one thing, where I live creates, um, my husband's just not thrilled about me having fires. We live on a, our more wood, our more flat, open, we have lots of grasses because we raise cattle. And it's very windy in Oklahoma and it's uh, dry. And so he's worried about fires. And so he said, I'd rather you didn't dig a pit and make an open fire out here. So I have electric kiln firing at my home. But I know how to do the traditional firing and sometimes in other places I will do that. Um, but I know how and I can teach it. And one of the things that Jane and I love to do now that both of us are teaching is that we can take a, an earthenware clay, and it's a commercial clay, but it feels very similar to my native clay. And when you're teaching people, you don't want to waste that clay because it's so hard mm -hmm. to process. But we'll um, make the same types of pots that we've made, fire them in an electric kiln, and then do a flash firing, second firing, and pine needles like this, the darkening, um, and determine the, the, what determines how black or how dark it's going to get us, how long you leave it in the, in the fuel. And um, I was doing mine in a tub with a lid and making it solid black, but you can just put it in open fire with the pine needles and it gives it a browning effect and smoking and it's just beautiful. And so even though you're not doing a traditional firing, you're doing a, a form of it. Mm -hmm. So the, my firing methods went way out of the bounds of what mom did. And um, you're limited by, you know, what you, what your home and your studio and your time and all that, so. When did you get your studio? That year that I got accepted at Santa Fe, my husband has a little, he's, he's lived on this ranch um, 40 years or more, and he built the house, and he had a little out building that had been a chicken house, and he had bricked it and raised it up, and so it's a little building, and his, his two boys, when they were growing up, were motorcycle nuts, and they would work on their motorcycles in this little building. Well, they were gone, so it was just sitting there empty with junk in it. So he helped me clean it out, and I painted the walls. It's a concrete floor. So I've had that same little studio since 1999. 
and uh, still use it. And it's simple. It's all I need. Perfect. How important is texture for your work? Well, for me, my art is more about texture than it is about glazing or shining. And mainly because I love the sculptural things and the faces, and you, you're not going to have a highly burnished face. And so the texture, to me, um, I love the way the clay feels in its natural state. I don't want to change it in too much, to change it too much to, to, uh, to appear shiny or to appear newer or whatever. But the part about texture that I'm leaning toward, and I don't have pieces that reflect that today except for the top of the head jar, but the stamping technique. I'm starting to really get interested in stamping because that's what Jane has been doing. And there were a couple of uh, artists from the Eastern Band that came and gave a, a program here a few years ago. I didn't get to attend, but Mother did. And they have a whole, the Cherokees in the Eastern Band have a whole different uh, technique of stamping than we thought we had, or that we thought we were doing stamping, but it's not the way they do it or did it. And they make big paddles with really intricate designs. And instead of just stamping in a uniform manner, like I've been doing, they continuously stamp the whole thing following a pattern using these designs and it just makes a beautiful stamped in the entire piece. So you don't do it a lot of burnishing on that. You want right. you want that texture to show. Right. And that's something that I'm leaning more toward that I'm making more stamps, making my own pottery stamps and uh, teaching stamp pottery and it's really fun. Um, and I did notice the, the fish pieces on your website, I think. I really like there was some blue tones in one of them, I think. But can you talk about... It was probably the smoking that just looked mm -hmm. blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You sort of mentioned your love of effigies and the um, importance of animal imagery in your work. Mm -hmm. um, you've al I've also seen you incorporate like shell earrings on a head pot, things like that. How much? How much do you incorporate other kinds of materials into the clay? Not really very often. I like copper. I'll use the copper wiring to make earrings. or um, And I've done shell earrings before, but I actually like to make the clay earrings now. When I do any ornament that I put on it, I like to make it from... Out of clay. Yeah, out of clay. So it's fun. You know, I've done... And I've done some jewelry. Mm -hmm. I've been doing some um, pottery pieces, like just a big bead that's maybe stamped. And then I have a friend that owns a bead store and a jewelry store where she puts together necklaces. And so we create necklaces together where she'll have the chain and then she'll do the little wire, you know, the hooking onto my pieces. But we'll mix um, my clay beads with other pottery beads or other beads. And I've sold necklaces for like three or four years. And it'll just maybe have a little tiny bit of pottery in it. And people love it I because know, part of it's handmade, but yet it's nice enough that you can wear it like a, and it's not fancy jewelry, it's just costume. Right. Fun. But do you um, have a name for your sort of collaborative venture or? Not really. <laughs> we just play. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I have done collaborations with, uh, with other potters. I did a collaborative a couple of pieces with Richard Zane Smith, and I'm now the proud owner of the piece that we made together and the bottom is what the piece that I made just plain pot and then he did his tiny coiling at the top and it ends up looking like a Hobie maiden with all those necklaces I just thought it was gorgeous and he just let me have it and um, then I've done a, I'm doing a collaboration with Jane we're going to do a large piece together because I don't know about large pieces and she's teaching me how to make the great big pots well just in the last few weeks in doing that work I've decided I can't do it I have too many issues with tension in my shoulders, and I've gotten arthritis, and my arms will ache, and it's too big, it's too much, and she's gotten away from the great big pieces that she used to make. So, um, but anyway, I collaborate, and I've collaborated with um, an artist that does weaving. Uh, she asked me, you probably know her, Marty uh, Gradoff. She's at Donald's work a lot. Maybe you don't know, but anyway, she's Winnebago. And we won an award at Idle Jord with a collaboration that we did. She did a weaving and wanted my little mask faces to hang within the weaving. And uh, it turned out wonderfully. And we, I think we got third place. But, um, and then I did collaborations with um, uh, Terry O'Brien, who is a Mohawk bead artist. And she lives on the East Coast. And I met her through the Smithsonian programs. Um, 
we came up with this idea. We're both very creative and she loves beadwork and that's all she does is beadwork and all I do is pottery. So I said, let's do something together and I created a dress out of clay and she told me, you know, we came up with the design first. Okay, we're going to do this kind of dress and I wanted to do the early Cherokee cape with the skirt. She told me how many holes to punch where. So I punched the holes, fired it and made it look like white buckskin. I shipped it to her, she did the beadwork and then we made a stand for it. And I entered it at Cherokee Art Market, but I don't think anybody knew what it was. And so they didn't know what, you know, it just got no notice and it was gorgeous. And Bill Wiggins, our friend that collects <laughs> art, bought, bought it. And he said, if you ever make any more, I want them. And we ended up making four different dresses. And then we stopped because we just got too busy with other things. But it's so much fun to have input from an art. I would never have thought of pottery and beads together mm -hmm. until I got to know her. And uh, we had seen maybe one other instance of where a potter had put beads on clay. So, yeah, um, yeah my little jewelry thing, I'd love to take that further, but right now I'm too busy with council work that right. to play. <laughs> how about your signature? Um, uh -huh. Wait, how did you come up with that? Um, I have my Indian name. I was, um, all of us, all of my siblings and my, myself were named by my mom's aunt and we were given Indian names. We don't know that there was a particular meaning, but my Cherokee name is Dayani, or Dayani, and it's D-A-Y-A-N-I, and the syllabary for it looks like a J-W-H, but the syllabary, you know, isn't actually the letters, but, so I started because my dad took a class on how to write and speak Cherokee. Mom didn't know how to write Cherokee. So I asked Dad, so let's figure out how to write my name. And so he showed me. So I always sign my clay with, with my real name, and, or my English name, and my Cherokee name, and then the year. With both? Uh -huh, both of them. And I put Victoria, I usually put, um, I was doing Victoria Mitchell Vasquez, <laughs> it was too much. So I usually put Victoria, and then the signature of the, the Diani, and then the, the date. Oh, and the date, too. Just the year. Yeah. The year. Do you title your pots ever? Sometimes. Um, for instance, this head jar, it, I named it Treasured Memories because I made it after Mom passed away mm -hmm. and it was for, specifically for the jury program for the Cherokee National Treasure Award and you have to create a piece of art just for that. And so I used her stamps to make the little crown on his mm -hmm. head and I um, made um, the, it's got tattooing on it which mm -hmm. are ancestors did and I was looking at pictures of just different Indian men and uh, so anyway I had a, I, I read a little story if I have a signature piece that that a collector has ordered or wants to buy I write the story to for them about the piece and it, it I will tell about how I made it a little bit about you know my process where I got the idea and a little bit about our mound builder ancestry and so I, I'm sure I had a little story about treasure memories but um, it was, it was that, you know, specifically that my mother was already a national treasure, and I used some of her clay and my clay. I still have uh, some clay that Daddy dug for Mom, and I used some of it on occasion, because um, there's just maybe a, a barrel, half of a barrel left or less. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just precious because the place where they dug it is not available anymore. Mm -hmm. And Daddy would have dug that before 1997, mm -hmm. so I, I love using that. How important a role do commissions play in your output? Um, more so now than before. When I wasn't a counselor and when I wasn't as busy, I had more time to play and just make pottery that I wanted to make. And I really didn't like, there are some times when I, I don't care for commission. If a person is too specific about how they want you to make it or what they want it to be like, I just say you better find somebody else. But if a person says, I love your work, I would like you to make me something, I don't care what it is, or if it's an effigy, you know, I like melons or whatever, and that's all they say, then I'm thrilled. And so currently I have uh, three ideas or three commissions from three from different people for a specific thing. One is a wedding gift, and it doesn't have to be a wedding jar, thank you, because uh, I don't <laughs> want to do the wedding basis, and they're not uh, typical Cherokee. Mm -hmm. But um, I look for that. I'll ask about why they want it, who it's for, and tell me something about that person that's significant. And in this one instance, the ladies find it for a wedding gift for her best friend, and the friend and her husband live on her original family's farm, and they call it Blackberry Hill. 
And so we came, me and the buyer came up with the idea of a shape of a bowl, and on the shoulder I'm going to do a stylized uh, engraving of a blackberry vine and, and maybe put some Indian designs on it too. But um, I love to do those creative things where they say, I want you to be creative with it. Here's an idea of what I'd like to have, but you just do your thing. Um, I love that because you know and that 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 piece is already sold. Um, I don't do that many shows anymore, so actually commissions are more important now. If I were not a counselor, I would probably be making a lot of pottery, you know, making it for specific people. Um, but also the collections, people that started collecting years ago have dropped off because either from age or they've got too many things already, they don't have room. So your collector base changes drastically, as you know, over years. And so I don't count on it, and I've never had to count on my art income to have live on, thank goodness, because I would be really skinny. <laughs> I would never eat. No, but, uh, I think because I don't have to do it for a living, it allows me to be more creative and enjoy it. Well, what is your creative process, starting with how you get your ideas? Um, generally, I have, the, I have a lot of ideas already, and I have a little sketchbook. And if I come up with something in my sleep and I wake up, you're thinking about something, I have to run and sketch it before I forget it. And I also have, so that's one, is like things that just come to you because you're always seeing things. I see faces in grain of wood and I see faces in clouds and I, you know, everywhere I look, I, I see things like animals or faces and so I'm like, oh, that would be a neat pot. So I'll maybe sketch it. Um, the other creative inspiration comes from, <coughs> excuse me, the fact that I still want to talk about and show our mound builders' um, ancestral things and talk about how, <clears throat> excuse me, how important that that era was, and we don't know what happened to those people, and it, people are just thrilled to hear about it, and I love talking about it. So I like to make pottery that reflects that, so that I can say, you know, one of my ancestors could have made this and show an artifact and say, now here's my rendition of it, or. Um, just the head jar thing. You know, I can see faces in a painting and I wish I could paint. And I'll think, well, I could maybe make that into a, a nice head jar of a, a face. I am sort of wanting to sculpt, but uh, I don't have a lot of time for that either. But I have done one sculpture that's a true sculpture that I'm going to have bronzed. Um, so ideas come to me from other artists, going to art shows, going to museums. When I was at the Smithsonian, during my research, there happened to be an Allen Hauser, a big Allen Hauser exhibit going on at the NMAI. And I took a lot of pictures of his things, and I came home and made, um, was really inspired. Could never copy what he does, but the idea of the flowing figure, mm -hmm. and that it would be a simple figure with just a mom's face, you know, and, and a baby form. And I came home and created something like that in my clay, in a very really small scale. I love his, um, his technique and, and his simplicity of his large sculptures are just, to me, breathtaking. And so anytime there's an Alan Hauser exhibit, I go see it. At the Oklahoma History Museum, I've done some classes for them, and I love that place. And <coughs> I get a lot of inspiration from, from that. What has been one of the decisive forks in your career when you sort of could have gone one way, but you chose to go another? Hmm. In, as far as the art? Business. Art. Clay. I'd say the biggest one lately has been the death of my mom. And whenever, right before she got really sick and had to go to the hospital, she was interviewed by a gentleman from, who's originally from Bonita, and he's now in New York City, and he's a, he creates uh, uh, production sets for, for uh, dramas and things. And I met this young man that was doing a video story of her and what he's actually wanting to end up with is a film about Indian Territory and Bonita when it was first formed and give a history of how impactful the Indians were in Bonita as well as end up showing moms and her story about recreating or you know reviving the art. And so I met him on the phone and via email and never met him in person until a year after mom died and he sent me a wonderful, after she passed away, he sent me a picture of her that he had taken the day he did the interview. And it ended up being the 
picture we used at her funeral. I now have it in my home, and she's just sitting there casually with a little pot beside her. And <clears throat> whenever he told me what he wants to do, and he has part Cherokee, um, I've decided to help him when I, how I can, in the, any way I can, because he eventually wants to take that program back to the National Museum of American Indian and have it have it uh, premiere there. And it'll be about Vanita and about Mom. And so uh, there are a group of people here in Vanita, some people that are like ones of city councilor and ones of museum person, and different people that are interested in uh, restoring the old courthouse that has been just set, sitting abandoned. And one of the things we want to do with this gentleman is make it a place where they can put on programs like a like a play, also have art there, and so we have this loosely formed group of people that I'm going to be involved with, and so he's been contacting me. He just recently contacted me again, and he said I would like to have. He said I'd really like to commission a head jar from you for this program as it comes about, and. We, I would like to come back to Vanita and spend some time and us have a, 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 a teaching workshop sort of thing, not necessarily me being the teacher, but fine potters that would come in and teach local uh, children about Native art and pottery and have it all woven into the story. And, and he sees it as being more than just one production or one film, but because he grew up here, he has a big affinity for Vanita and his his family's from here, and his, um, we met through, his sister worked at Clanton's Cafe, and saw my mom one day, and went up to her, and she said, you look a lot like my grandmother, who passed away. Well, it ended up, my mom and her, her grandmother went to boarding school together, mm -hmm. and so they started this friendship, and so, uh, J.J. Lynn is the young man's name that is currently uh, working on something in New York, and then he's going to come here this summer and work and start on this program. So I see myself um, veering more away from creating art to sell into becoming an educator and a helper and a community, just, you know, a person that's a, an asset to the community by, based upon the things I've learned and the things I know about our tribe and our history and our art and my mom and all those things together are important. And the older you get, the more you realize you only have so many years left. Hopefully I have a few that you can do things physically and mentally and that you have the ability to speak for someone else and so I see myself doing more of those kinds of things and then being an artist. So it, it, my career has taken a whole different <laughs> different turn obviously. <laughs> Politics, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> what has been one of the low points of your career? Oh goodness. Um, Probably, no, I don't want to talk about that. Um, there's really not been a low point as far as my career. There have just been situations and, and incidents where and it had to do with jealousy of other people. You know, women, jealousy, art, competition. Competition has always been, it seems like the catalyst for something negative, <laughs> in my case. <laughs> Uh, and I don't really like that whole competing thing. So uh, the low point would probably be a breakup of a friendship over that sort of thing. And um, trying to do the same thing that somebody else is doing and you're trying to do your thing, but yet they're trying to keep up with you or surpass you or make it into a competition and, and it, it ruined your friendship. So that's probably the only negative low point. And how about one of the high points I don't, you might have mentioned? Already, but. Oh my goodness! Um, the I think the high point was the Smithsonian research to get selected for that, get to go do it, and then for them to have my work, and then they have one of my pots is on display on the fourth floor. I mean, how many people get to do that? And I get pictures from people all over the place, just over the years, and it's been up you know since 2006. I'll get pictures of friends that are visiting and. Just the other day, this young man I was talking about sent me a text. He said he had a picture of my pot, and he said, NMAI, DC, I'm here, lovely. I mean, you know, I get these, and it's just awesome. And, I, and the, the other big high point just happened. In April, we had uh, the National Museum hosted the Cherokee Tribe for uh, about four days. 
and the Eastern Band came, we had Katua Band people there, and, and us, the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, and the chief was there, and because I'm a counselor, I have better access than I would have had before to the chief and to the other counselors, and several counselors were there, and our speaker, to get to take them upstairs in the elevator and show them Victoria has pottery here, and they posed with me. Here I've got a picture of me and our chief with my little pot, and Jane Austy had her in the picture. Just getting, you know, they don't have any idea. People that are not artists have no idea what it means, what we do, how much it means to other people, and what how well what a museum is about, and how people get excited that just go see those things. And people, you know, everyone has their own loves and interests, but. Um, I just can't imagine our world without art <laughs> and how important it is to me and I like to create that same love in somebody else's eyes, you know. But that was the big high point and that just happened in April, so. It was wonderful. Well, we're going to take a look at your pots here in a minute. Is there anything else we've forgotten to talk about or that you'd like to add? Oh, goodness. I don't think so. Um, the, the probably the only thing I'd like to add is the fact that I'm looking forward to helping the other Cherokee National Treasures and the elders. Every year we lose one or two of our Cherokee National Treasures and once that person's gone, if they haven't taught someone in their family or some young person how to do what they do, it's gone again. And it's all about the lost arts that have been revived and I think that's going to be my biggest focus is keeping um, as many people as possible aware of how important that is not to lose those arts again. You can't make another Anna Mitchell. You can't recreate what she recreated. You can only take what she taught those of us that were fortunate to learn and to pass it on. You know, we're getting older, we're all going to pass away, and we've got to have, we've got to keep it going. And we've done a great job of re reviving interest in our history and our culture, and we need to keep it going. And so that's that's one of my most uh, important goals for the next few years. Victoria, would you like to talk about this pot a little bit? Yes, um, this pot has brings back wonderful memories of the first couple of years I was with, the first year I was with mother, and this is made from the same clay that mom and dad had dug. I made a red slip. The clay color um, is a lot lighter than what this pot appears. And the symbols on it come from our research book called Sun Circles in Human Hands. And the round um, circle with the wind symbol and then the four directional cross are very symbolic with our culture and with, with our ceremonies. At the very top, uh, the rim has a little, uh, very simple design that mom um, used a lot. And if you carry that forward and repeat it many times, it looks like a basket. It's called a Cherokee Friendship Design. So this, this and that pot's heavy. You know, the uh, early work is, is a lot heavier than what I make now because you don't know how to make thin pot, thin pottery. So it's a good reminder of how I started, and I like to, to keep this with me as a reminder of, of the progress that I made, but where I started with Mom. And I can remember her laughing and saying, why do you want to make that? That's one of the hardest designs, doing the circle and you know, making it all fit on there. But um, she said, you always want to seem to take the hardest thing first. But it just seemed like the thing to do at the time. And I made, I recreated that pot a few years later and sold it and it won an award and it was, you know, about 10 times better <laughs> than that one. All right. How about this one? Okay, I did talk about this earlier a, a little bit, but this was one of my biggest challenges. And I made this about four years after I had started making pottery and I saw a drawing of a tripod head jar or head water bottle in our research material that came from the mounds. And it was just a drawing of these three heads uh, with simple faces and I challenged myself to make it and figure out how to do it. And I did, was thrilled with the outcome. And this portal piece has such a story. I made it and then I took it. I, I was able to get the Phoenix story with that in my lap and and then I sold it to a collector in California and shipped it out there and it arrived broken. And it was broken where the heads attached to the three tripods. 
and it was double box. I'd never had a piece broken in shipping, but it was broken. And he shipped it back to me, which was the wrong thing to do, because in order to get insurance from UPS, you have to have them come and see the piece. That they, so anyway, long story short, it was actually a blessing because he ordered another one, so I recreated one and sent it to him. So I got the insurance money for the broken one. I got, the, you know, paid for the new one. And as a result of me having this piece back in my hands, I had a restoration person help me put it back together, and you can't tell that it was ever broken. And that's the piece that the curator of the Smithsonian NMAI saw that picture in the newspaper and ordered one. So I made one of these for the Smithsonian. Then when I did my research, which was about three years after this pot was made, when I got the fellowship, I saw the actual one that the drawing had been drawn from. The actual tripod head jar was in archives, and it was about a third that size. And it wow. was just amazing. I got to take a picture of it. So it's quite a story, and I will keep that forever because it, it's been around the block a couple of times. And your head pot here. Okay, I made this head jar um, for a specific purpose. When I was nominated for Cherokee National Treasure in 2012, the jury panel asked one of the requirements is that you create a piece of pottery just for that. And I wanted to make um, something very uh, close to my heart, that, and I love the head jars, but I also wanted to reflect because mom was, had already passed away, and I wanted to put some of her memory in that. So I made the head jar and I used uh, clay from mom's batch that was still left over. I made my own slip. The dark red part is a slip and the lighter color is also a slip that I made and painted and fired. Uh, the earrings have the symbols from our mound builders uh, drawings that came off of early pottery. The tattooing, there's tattooing all over the back of the head and the front and our ancestors probably in the 1700s we see drawings of they did heavily tattooed faces. And then at the top, this was just a little embellishment that I thought of, and I put the discs on the top of the head, and then I stamped the discs with mother's handmade pottery stamps that I still own and that I treasure. And so I named it Treasured Memories um, because it truly does reflect a lot of memories and, and uh, ancient uh, history. So it, then after I did receive the award, this was purchased by Cherokee Nation to go on permanent display here at our Cherokee Nation Health Clinic in Benita. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Victoria. <laughs>